David knew that his only hope for forgiveness was to be found in the Lord. He knew the value of cherishing scripture and he benefited from its warnings. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you would speak to each one of us through your word, by the power of your spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. Do, do take a seat. I wonder how often you have heard comments such as the following. If only God would prove to me that he exists. Or I could believe in God if only he'd reveal himself to me. Maybe someone you know has said something similar to you recently. Maybe you yourself have expressed a similar sentiment in the past. Or even saying it right now as you struggle to make sense of God and Christianity. If only God would prove to me that he exists. Well, our text before us tonight is a wonderful piece of scripture that goes some way to answering such thoughts. So please do turn to it with me, Psalm 19, the first in a run of psalms that we're going to be looking at uh, over the course of the next few Sunday evenings, and it's uh, page 552. The psalms um, are a great collection of uh, inspired Hebrew prayers and hymns covering a variety of different situations and issues. Many, such as this one, were written by King David, Israel's greatest human king. But what they all have in common is that they express truth about God in ways designed to move our emotions. The poetic language addresses our minds through our hearts. But the value of the Psalms isn't just in the expression of the emotions. It is also in the shaping of our emotions. Think of them, if you will, as God-given responses to a range of different circumstances. And Psalm 19 in particular is great for helping us give expression to our praise of God, both generally through creation and specifically through his word, as well as providing a model response to that revelation he gives us. So our four headings uh, tonight, and these with space for notes, can be found, as usual, on the reverse of your service sheets. Firstly, we celebrate God's general revelation through creation. Secondly, his personal revelation through scripture. Thirdly, his supreme revelation through Jesus Christ. And finally, we'll look at the appropriate response. Firstly, then, God's general revelation in creation. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. In other words, God's very creation reveals something about him. Specifically, it would seem that the heavens are on David's mind here. The amazing displays of God's creative power and his influence Both day and night, the sun, moon, and stars all testify to the existence of a creator. Now, I've been uh, very fortunate that my previous job has taken me closer to the heavens than most people's jobs would allow. And uh, flying on a Nimrod in the Royal Air Force, I've witnessed the sun rise and set in many different locations around God's creation. Nighttime sorties would often mean returning to base as dawn breaks. It's quite a sight to be above the clouds, watching the amazing spectacle of the sunrise coming forth from its pavilion like a champion, rejoicing to run its course, as verse 5 says. Occasionally, as we took in the beauty of the colours dancing across the sky, I would try and provocatively break the silence uh, that was on our crew intercom. And I would try and say something like, and some people insist such beauty happens by chance. Of course, it was really... Uh, less of a statement and more of a question, designed to make my colleagues think beyond that which they were simply 
seeing. And that is kind of what David is doing in this psalm. He is saying that despite the lack of actual words, there is a message going out here to absolutely everyone. Verse 3, there is no speech or language, no literal words, where their voice is not heard. Verse 4, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In other words, look at the design. Look at the ordered nature of things. Look at the detail. Look at the beauty. And then look beyond. It's absurd to think that the sun rises and sets by chance. Who makes such things? Who controls them? They're surely obvious questions to ask. Sadly, though, people seem to refuse to ask such obvious questions, or at least to answer them. So are they really that obvious? Well, I decided to try a little experiment on my eldest son this week. Uh, I'm sure that sounds actually worse than, <laughs> than it was. Um, he had the opportunity a few months ago to visit the Olympic Stadium with his school, and he was one of the first to actually run on the Olympic track. And he ran down the 100-meter track in lane seven, and he was so excited this week when Usain Bolt ran in lane seven. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, I said to him, I said, imagine you pitch up at the Olympic Park, and you're standing in front of that impressive stadium, and you don't know anything about the Olympics. You don't know anything about London. You don't know anything about sports. What would you think about what, what was standing before you? And without hesitating, he replied, I'd want to know why it was there and who put it there. Without thinking, he admitted that the nature of what was before his very eyes, the scale, the design, the, the size, the layout of it, would force him to ask certain foundational questions. Who? Why? And likewise, we see in verses uh, 1 to 6, we see that they ask a question, ask the question of everyone who has ever lived. Who made this and why? Now, the Apostle Paul actually goes further, and in his letter to the Romans, he says that we are without excuse for ignoring God through this question. Chapter 1, um, verse 18 of Romans says this, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. To return to the person who expresses the opinion, if only God would prove to me that he exists, God says to him, the proof is all around you. I've put it there for you. <coughs> day by day, night by night, my creation means that you are without excuse. In fact, Paul says, such people are not only without excuse, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against them. You see, creation only reveals enough of God for you and for me to be inexcusably guilty for not turning to its creator in worship of him. And therefore, we need something more. The created order cannot vocalize, it cannot communicate the personal revelation from God that we so desperately need. That's where God's word comes in, which brings me to my second point. God's personal revelation in Scripture, verses 7 to 11. Isn't it fantastic that the, the author of creation has chosen to make himself known to us, not just in a distant way, like in the way that I've been getting to know all about Mo Farah, Jess Ennis, and the uh, Brownlee brothers from what I've been watching on television this week. Not in a distant way, but in a personal way, bound up in an intimate, meaningful, precious relationship as the very one who created us, sustains us, and guides us by his word. Psalm 19 emphasizes the nature of this pers personal revelation in a way that perhaps isn't immediately obvious to the 21st century reader. And that emphasis is found in the choice of words that David uses for God. In verses 1 to 6, you'll observe that David refers to the creator God, a distant yet powerful deity. But from verse 7, 
David refers to Yahweh. It's translated as Lord in small capitals in our Bibles. And this is hugely significant because this is the name by which God has chosen to make himself known to his people. If you recall, he explains this to Moses by means of a burning bush in Exodus 3. It's a name that reveals the depth of God's commitment to his people through his promise to be with them, to provide for them, and ultimately to redeem them. You see, creation just tells us something about God. It's only through God's self-revelation, through his word, that we can really know the Lord, Yahweh, personally. When we study his word, we get to know just how committed he is to the people he has created and how much he longs to be known by them. I wonder how many of us think of God as a distant, uninterested deity. How many of us actually know him as our personal rescuer and Lord? I think David did. He knew the importance of Yahweh's self-revelation through scripture, and he sought to express what it meant to him. And so we get this emotive description that builds to a crescendo in verse 10. Now, don't let words such as law or commands put you off here. We need to, well, initially at least, we need to read this psalm as the Israelites would have done. And in the Old Testament, the word law is a comprehensive term that, me, that meant all that God wanted us to know about himself. So David wasn't just referring to the Ten Commandments here, but to all of Yahweh's self-revelation that had been written down up until the point that David is writing this psalm. So the words law, statutes, precepts, commands, ordinances are just titles for God's word. And as such, it is perfectly valid for us to apply the nine qualities and five benefits in verses 7 to 11 to the complete canon of God's word that we have in our Bibles today. Do you see these qualities in verses 7 to 11? Yahweh's self-revelation through the Bible, Bible is perfect and trustworthy verse 7. It's right and radiant, verse 8. Pure, enduring, sure and righteous, in verse 9. And the climax of verse 10, it is oh so precious. Why? Well, David articulates five benefits. It's precious because, verse 7, God's word brings refreshment, reviving souls, enabling simple folk to live wisely. It's precious because in verse 8 it gives us joy in our hearts and provides illumination so that we can see the way to go. And lastly, it's precious in verse 11 because it warns us to be faithful so as to enjoy a great reward. So because of all these qualities and benefits, The word of God, Yahweh's specific personal revelation is precious. It's more precious than gold, sweeter than honey. This is great poetic language. It conveys an intensity of, a longing for, and satisfaction through scripture. The challenging question for us is do our emotions correspond to those of David's? Do you value and cherish God's word the way David did? Does anything need to change in how much you read it, how we remember it, how you live it out day by day? To return once more to our friend who wants proof that that God exists, has he ever read any of God's word? Can we help him out? Can we help her out and introduce them to Yahweh through its pages? If we don't, how will they ever be saved? The warning in verse 11 marks the third transition in this psalm. David moves from proclaiming the glories of God's creation to his word and then to an internal reflection in response. But before we get there, it would be helpful for us to take a slight detour from the progressive structure of Psalm 19 and consider my third heading. God's supreme revelation through Jesus Christ. You see, not only is God's general revelation in creation celebrated here, not only is his specific personal revelation, his word celebrated here, 
But David's psalm also points to God's supreme and ultimate revelation in Jesus Christ. Now, by God's grace and mercy, we live at a point in history where we can look back at Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and appreciate the earth-shattering significance of those events. We benefit from having the New Testament scriptures. And so as we look back at Psalm 19 through, through that sort of lens, if you like, we can celebrate God's supreme revelation of Jesus in it. Consider Hebrews 1, our New Testament reading earlier. It says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets and many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Looking back, we know that Jesus was involved in the very creation that David is celebrating in Psalm 19. Or consider John 1, where Jesus is described as the word that has existed since the beginning. When we apply that perspective and we look back at Psalm 19, we see Jesus shining forth from verses 7 to 11 there too. Indeed, Jesus said himself that he did not come to abolish the law, he had come to fulfill it. So if Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, then surely it is appropriate for us to think of him as the ultimate revelation of God in these verses. Look again at verses 7 to 11. Jesus is perfect reviving our souls. Jesus is trustworthy, making the simple wise. He is right, bringing us joy. He is radiant, giving us light. He is pure, enduring forever, sure and altogether righteous. Jesus is more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. By him we are warned. And in following and obeying him, there is great reward. Jesus is the glorious, he is the ultimate, he is the supreme revelation of God. He surpasses creation and the law because creation was made through him and the law is fulfilled in him. And the amazing thing is that Jesus is not only the ultimate revelation of God, he is the eternal redeemer. Verse 14, David appeals to Yahweh as his rock and his redeemer. In his mind, David must be recollecting God's deliverance from all sorts of danger. As a nation singing this psalm, Israel couldn't help but bring to mind God's faithful rescuing time and again, not least in, in the great exodus from Egypt. And for 21st century Christians, when we read of a redeemer, we can't help but think of our rescuer hanging on a cross in our place. It's Jesus. He is the eternal redeemer of humanity. Ephesians 1 Verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You see, when we look down at the second half of verse 13 of Psalm 19, we see a logic that, the ver that in that logic of that verse is that our, nat nat our natural state is one for which we are to be blamed. You and I are guilty of great transgressions against the living God as we reject his lordship and we seek to replace him with our own selfish desires. David knew that his only hope for forgiveness was to be found in the Lord. He knew the value of cherishing scripture and he benefited from its warnings. Which leads nicely to my concluding point. What is the appropriate response to this great revelation of God, generally through creation, personally through scripture, and supremely through Christ. Well, I pray that for us, like for David, it will be one of humble repentance as we come under the divine influence of the word. And so my fourth and final heading, an appropriate response, humble repentance. The psalm gets the priority right the priority that we often fail to live out. It has God and his majestic glory front and center. Let us get the perspective right in our lives too. Here is God, the perfect, the, the righteous, the powerful, the sovereign creator. Here am I, created, not creator, sinful, 
totally to blame for my own transgressions. And yet God wonderfully condescends to reveal himself to us through his word and through Jesus. And David can't help in this instance to reflect on his own moral failures, both known and unknown, in response. Verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. We can see the flow of David's thought throughout the psalm here. Just as the sun in verse 6 rises and, and sets and searches every nook and cranny with its heat as it follows that divine course across the skies, so we, in response, should allow God's divine word to search every nook and cranny of our souls. We seek forgiveness, both from sins committed willingly, but also from those that we have forgotten, those that we have rationalized, those that we have committed in ignorance. This is the reminder we had at the start of our service this evening. And we pray for freedom from sin's power over us. May they not rule over us. And asking for God's help, we repent. That means we simply change direction with his help and we pray like David. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So what about you? How will you respond to this great psalm tonight? Will you celebrate God's creation? Will you take every opportunity to thank him for the beauty and the order and the truth it reveals to mankind about his very existence? Will you commit to know him deeper through his word, recognizing that scripture will refresh you, will give you wisdom and inner joy, and will also light your way forward? And will you submit to and will you cherish Jesus Christ, your rescuer, the eternal redeemer, more than anyone or anything else? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great, the great psalm. We pray that by it you would shape our minds and emotions to the truth that is revealed in it. Father, we praise you for your creation. We give you thanks for your word and we pray that you would forgive our hidden faults and keep us from willful sins. Father, we pray this through the name of your Son, our rock, our eternal redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.